Hey, hey everybody, Jay here. I'm back with another quick video for you guys today. I was gonna make this big elaborate production. I had all kinds of stuff written up and scripted and just, I mean, this is like a five or six pages, but I just don't really have the time to put together the production that I'd really like to, but I did wanna share this with you. And so today I'm gonna to show you guys how I built a quick induction heating setup for shrink fit tooling. Basically, shrink fit tooling is kind of like the, uh, the Ferrari of the tooling world. And I had wanted to get my hands on some shrink fit tooling and, and the, the components for it for a while, but it was just cost prohibitive. The cheapest machine I could find was from Mara Tool for about 3,500 bucks. By the time you pay tax and freight, you're you know $4,000 deep. And it was something that about a year and a half ago I wanted, but I didn't necessarily need it. But now we're kind of heading into the need territory with some five axis machining. Recently, Haas released one of their tip of the day videos talking about all the different styles of tool holders. And then a couple of weeks ago, ironically, my buddy Jesse from Puzzle Box Props sent me a text with a video showing him using a high powered induction heating coil setup he got on eBay to shrink tools in and out and it working well. So the Haas video got me motivated. Jesse's video convinced me that this was a doable project. And so I went on eBay and I ordered up one of those kits. It was about 180 bucks, 190 bucks. It's a 2700 watt coil, I believe, with a 3000 watt power supply. The power supply has a 220 volt input, single phase, and it outputs 48 volts DC. It comes with like a water pump and a little power supply and everything you need to basically get going. I just went to Home Depot and I bought my own power cord to fit the outlet in our wall in the shop. I then took an old 3D printer, I broke it down and I used the aluminum extrusion to create a base. I went into SolidWorks and I 3D printed like a little shelf that bolted onto the bottom of the induction heater and then would connect to the base. That way I had something to travel the, the little the heater up and down. And then I powered everything up and decided to head over to the bench and shrink in some tools. So let's head out to the shop and I'll show you exactly how that worked. After some quick off-camera testing, I decided to shrink in a 3 8 inch end mill. That's roughly 10 millimeters. Before firing up the heating coil, I decided to check the tolerance of the end mill shank. And what, the way I did this was by stacking up a couple of gauge blocks. It was a 250 thousandths and 125 thousandths gauge block. And I checked them with my stare at mic. I then checked the shank on a couple of end mills. Next, I used some metal binder clips to control how much the end mill would stick out of the tool holder. And lastly, I plugged in the power supply. I ended up flipping the switch to turn on the heating coil and I waited for the tool holder to heat up. Now we'll just let it cool. If you guys decide to do this project yourself or you want to implement this, just be very careful. I urge you to just take caution. Don't do anything you're not careful with. Make sure you insulate yourself, insulate your tools. Uh, just, just be very careful. Uh, electricity, mains electricity is just nothing to scoff at. It's especially when you're talking about 220 volts. So with that said, here are three tips. First and foremost, make sure that you have a switch between your power supply and your actual induction heating unit. I'm not gonna get into the details, but if you do any research on what are called tank circuits, you'll find that they actually have, they resonate. And so what you wanna do is plug in your power supply first, let it come up to power, and then flip the switch to instantly deliver current to the induction heating coil. That way you don't damage the induction heating coil. So that's step number one. Tip number two is a little bit more simple. It's just that this lower power style of induction heating coil, for myself at least, I, I designed it specifically for carbide tooling. If you want to shrink in tool steel tools or high speed steel tools into shrink fit tool holders, 
you may or may not have success with something in this 2700 to 3000 watt range. And the reason is those materials expand at a similar rate to tool steel. And so you may not be able to heat the, the holder up fast enough to get your tool out. So just keep that in mind. I did this purely for carbide. And last but not least, shank tolerance. This is something I didn't even know anything about. I really didn't ever take this into consideration until watching the most recent Haas tip of the day video. But you only have probably about a thou to a thou and a half of actual compression on the end mill itself from the holder in its normal, you know, ready to machine state. So if you end up with an end mill that's undersized by a thousandth, you may not have you may not have any compression at all, or or you what's even worse than not having any compression at all is having just enough compression to fool you into thinking that you're ready to go out and start doing some cutting. And then next thing you know, you get tool pull out, you scrap the part, you break a 40 or $50 end mill, and maybe even you destroy your $200 tool holder. So just keep that in mind. Shank tolerance is absolutely critical. So those are three tips that if you're gonna do this, I would take those into consideration when you do. All right, guys, let's wrap this up real quick. The overall conclusion that I've drawn from this project is that technology is cheap. Some of these projects are simple. There's a vast amount of information that allows us to uh, do some of these unique things that weren't able to be done in the past. And so for a few hundred bucks, a hobbyist or home shop machinist could literally take advantage of shrink fit tooling. Now that my proof of concept device has worked and we've got some tools in and out of tool holders down to a quarter of an inch, it's time for me to kind of finalize this project. I'm gonna 3D print a bunch of brackets to permanently mount the power supply, protect all the wirings and mains voltages so that it can't be touched by an operator. I'm the only one that'll be using this, by the way, just for reference. I'm gonna mount the switch, and in time, I may even wire up an Arduino and a stepper motor to raise this thing up in Z on its own. So, hope you guys enjoyed watching this video just as much as I enjoyed making it, and we will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. Who am I kidding? We all knew that you guys weren't gonna let me finish this video without trying to get one out, right? Getting it in is the easy part. So this is the smallest holder I have. I ordered uh, an eighth inch from Maratool, but it didn't come. And so uh, we'll go ahead and try to shrink this one out real quick. So lift this up. Notice I've got it sitting on a couple of keys that go on the bottom side of a rotary. Cause that's just what I happen to have. But uh, I just, when I designed this whole rig, this was just the very first, you know, generation one prototype. I just wanted to see how close we were. If, if you know, just, just prove, proof of concept more than anything. And so now that we have a little bit of proof of concept, now we can go ahead and, uh, you know, kind of clean it up and maybe I'll even automate it with some stepper motors or something like that. It just depends how much time I have. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll uh, clip this on here. Just, just, just an inexpensive you know, paper clip or whatever that we use here in the shop for a lot of different stuff. And uh, let me plug this on. Let me plug it in and turn it on. We'll see what we got. Obviously we got it in, now can we get it out? Let's try to set this down in this jar real quick. All right, here goes nothing. Um, you know what, I'm going to put one more clip on the bottom side because now that I've had uh, an end mill fall through from being too big, I will hate to see that happen again. And so just for safety or just to keep this thing from running away on us, maybe this will be a little bit of an indicator telling us that, hey, we're ready to go. So here we go. Power supply's on. If you guys are watching this on YouTube, I guess we're keeping track. We'll see how long it takes. I would think that it's gotta be getting close. No? Well, it is. Okay, boom. Oh. This is a long end though, obviously. All right, there we go, guys. In, then out. And that's a quarter inch end mill. I don't know if this is in frame or not. I can't tell because I can't see the screen, but pretty long shank end mill. That's that. I'm super pumped. I'm able to use shrink fit for some really high clearance area. I really need clearance. 
The, my primary motivation for this more than anything was just to get more clearance, less run out, longer tool life, Primarily clearance for the five axis stuff, but I love the idea of lower run out, uh, longer tool life, better surface finishes. So, all right, that's that. See you guys in the next one. Bye-bye. What are you still doing here? The video is over. Since you're still here though, you may have heard me say something about dropping an end mill into a tool holder and what the hell, we all blow out once in a while. So I figured I'd show you one of my quick bloopers. Hope you guys get a kick out of this and we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye bye. Now I gotta leave it. <clears throat> oh shit. <laughs> Just in case you take the clip off a little bit early and it hasn't shrunk down to size, you might lose an end mill in your holder. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in the next one. Bye bye.